If that is the case, I'll just float the copy the relevant bits. And if you want the copy, come and see me. Um, I mentioned to some of you last week in this in the seminars that this is a really excellent book if you want to look at the role of journalism in society. Um, I was alarmed to discover that the library doesn't have any copies, so I sent an urgent email to the librarian this morning to say that not only is it an excellent book, it's very thin and it's very cheap. And so I'm hoping we'll get that sorted out very soon. Um, finally, investigative journalism. You should be looking for examples of investigative journalism because these are key ethical uh, subjects uh, for your essays. And there's one yesterday. Um, I know we talk a lot about The Guardian and uh, write on liberal pits like that. But even the Daily Mail, look, the Daily Mail was important work. Um, maybe its motives were questionable. You can have a look into that. Maybe all journalism investigations are questionable. You can have a look at that one in yesterday's Daily Mail. Um, strange enough, the Daily Mail's rival in, in the sense of being its uh, bête noir, the, the newspaper that the, that the Mail hates more than any other, the Guardian is actually also doing a big investigation into uh, NHS, which would be useful for you to look at. And I think that's all the parish notices. Um, please return your orders of service to the... <coughs> yeah, finally, that, finally, I'd like to see my Mac 393, my own Mac 393 practical project students at the end. You know who you are. <laughs> With no further ado, I will give the stage to Tony Abrendel. Hey! Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm Tony Abrendel and um, I am a Sunderland graduate. Um, I got a 2-1 in English studies many moons ago. came out of the university and didn't have a clue what I was going to do. <coughs> While I was studying, I decided that I wanted to work and earn some money and I managed to get a job at Northern Rock. Um, I was repossessing houses, which was great fun and taught me a lot of things about ethics. Um, but more to the point, I was sat near the marketing team and I was watching what they were doing all day. And I thought that looks like a lot more fun than what I'm doing. So I went on and um, got a number of work experience places. And when I graduated, I got my first PR job um, in an agency called Gentle Persuasion. And from there, um, I've got over 20 years experience in PR now. Um, I've been a member of the CIPR for over 10 years. Um, and I've worked in-house for a number of large brands, including Whitbread and Ford, so they're two names you probably recognise. And um, I've also run a number of large agencies, um, running the teams, as well as actually delivering the PR. Um, I have my own agency for 10 years called E2 Media. And around 18 months ago, um, I decided that I was ready just to do some consultancy work and to work with people who wanted a career in PR, so I set up Get Brindled. Um, I specialise in ethical PR, um, and I always look for um, fresh, open and honest clients who want me to work with integrity. They're my, my key words when I'm talking to potential new clients. Um, and I now have a client base which is a mix of charities and companies that want to make a difference. So what does ethics mean? The dictionary meaning of it is, um, as it says up here, the moral principles that govern a person's behaviour or the conducting of an activity. When you actually dig down into ethics though, it means something very different to, to each individual. How, how does it affect what you do in everyday life? Is it doing and saying the right thing? Is it acting in the right way? Is it helping people? Is it not lying or covering up? Um, is it just being honest and upfront and not trying to persuade opinion? That's where we come to PR. PR does persuade opinion, and the main role of it is to influence people. So with that in mind, can PR and ethics do they fit? Do they work together? Can PR be ethical? Politicians use it to influence and they're absolutely hated for it. Football pundits do it all the time and completely revered for it. So where's that fine line of we are being ethical or not? Examples of the, the PR industry, the spin doctors at their very worst. 
they did a lot of damage to the industry. Um, around 12 years ago, PR was something that a lot of people were considering coming out of and going into journalism. Funnily enough now, everyone's coming out of journalism and going into PR. Um, so really, to work out if PR can be ethical, you have to ask yourself, what is it and what are you using it for? First and foremost, PR is a communications tool. It's through the media, newspapers, TV, radio, magazines, but PR is much more than that now. It's face to face. A lot of the PR do I do for my clients is out and about. I'm at events, I'm talking to people. Um, obviously, uh, with technology, it's now online. So PR is everywhere. We're surrounded by it every day. Websites, they're PR. Social media is PR. Blogs are PR. Anything that's communicating is now a form of PR. And as a PR practitioner, I deliver those every day and have to think about how I can best apply ethics to what I'm doing. It's also used to educate people, so it's an educational tool. It's a written educational <coughs> tool for what you want to tell people, what you want them to know about. And again, ethics need to be applied, um, and we'll come on to that about your relationship with clients and with the media shortly. Um, high on the list as well for what PR is, um, and is what your clients, if you go into the PR world, will want to hear, is that it's a sales tool. <coughs> it's used to increase footfall, to increase sales, to in improve a brand. It's all about getting people to think wisely and to use you as a company or buy your product. So through that, basically what you are doing is manipulating people's choices. Is manipulation ethical? Probably not. <laughs> but nowadays, as PR practitioners, um, we have to be ethical. With all of what I've just said, it would look like PR couldn't be ethical at all. But we have to work by strict guidelines and codes. I think that's a lot of what you're going to be looking at this week. So I'm just going to give you a little bit labour here of what I do to make sure that I'm within my ethical guidelines. There's seven things that I do that I apply to get brindled in the way that I work. First of all is um, I'm a member of the CIPR, as I said, for the last ten years. They have a strict code of conduct. Um, it's actually on the website if you want to go on and have a look and I think we'll be studying it this week. It's um, seven, eight pages long. It's pretty depth and it's pretty strict. And if you break down, you can get thrown out of the CIPR and you're not supposed to be able to practice. Um, they are getting more and more strict and more stringent. Um, and you have to return um, things to the CIPR to prove how you're behaving as a practitioner now. Um, if you want to retain their, their member status. And more and more clients, particularly um, public sector clients, want proof that you're part of the CIPR before they'll even work with you. Um, so I'm going to leave those regulations and um, I think they're going to be photocopied for you if you want to copy. Um, I'm also part of an organisation called MBSL. They are a public funder for um, companies in the North East who need help with marketing. So that can be a new business startup or it can be a business that proves that it's ready to take the next step and it's going to create jobs. Um, so I'm a supplier for, for MBSL and if they get a company that they think is a match with me, then they introduce it um, and it's up to me to then put the business from them. But again, they've got really strict codes of conduct. Um, you have to sign up to them, it's like a legal document when you come on board as a supplier. So again, have a look on their website, because um, there's code of conduct on there, um, and it's all very clear and transparent in certain ways that you have to behave. Um, RTC North is another one, they're a Sunderland based funding agency, um, and I'm a supplier for them, they have a similar code. Um, so all these things are really good when you're talking to a new client or you're talking to journalists to prove that you have proper codes of conduct. Um, I don't work with clients and they, they have um, a contract of their own on how they work with their clients if they have a code of conduct. So that's a really good way of checking up whether the company that you're going to be working with is ethical. You can be as ethical as you want, but if you're working with a company that doesn't care um, and expect you to behave in a different way, then it's really a non-starter. Um, I also have my own terms and conditions, T's and C's. These, these protect me and protect the client. Um, I've just printed off a copy which again I'll leave um, and please feel free um, to have a look at it and uh, include any of that that you want to see where you do and it's, uh, it's freely available on my website as well. Um, the main part of the, the T's and C's which um, I took legal advice on um, is that Get Brindles under undertakes to keep all sensitive and unpublished material, data and information confidential. 
So basically, when I write a press release for a client, I get them to sign it off, and it doesn't go to the media until they sign it off, and it's the last and final version of it. At that point, I know I'm covered, because they've said that that information can go out. So whether what is in that press release or not is true, I can <coughs> based on what the client information has given to me. So the next part of my contract is that I do not accept liability for any information submitted by the client which is presented to the media on behalf of the client, which later transpires to be false. I make that very clear with my clients. A big part of it is about having a client um, um, practitioner relationship. But again, we'll come on to that shortly. Um, another thing that I'm having to sign more and more of um, to make sure that um, we are behaving ethically in the PR world is something called an NDA, no disclosure agreement and arrangement. We talk about those with them in lectures. No, but I probably should. But if you haven't mentioned that's okay. Yeah, they, um, they're basically signing your life away. You're saying that whatever a client tells you um, will stay between you. So if you're working for a client in crisis management, for example, if they've got something that's gone horrendously wrong and they want you to dig them out of it, keep them out of the media, um, do their internal communications, they need to tell you warts and all. Um, and a lot of the time, they won't want you to repeat that warts and all. They want you to tell them how to make good of a bad situation. So a lot of the time, I, I sign an NDA. If I'm then not comfortable with the information that I'm given, um, I have actually resigned a few clients on the back of those um, because they've wanted me to say things that aren't the whole truth. Uh, the NDA covers me as much as it does them, um, but it's something really, um, you can have a look at them online, if you, if you Google um, non-disclosure agreement, you can go in and it's quite an interesting practice too because you can fill in the details. So if you make up kind of the client, yourself, what the situation is, um, and it'll give you one. You then have to pay something like £15 to buy it, but you can read it online. So have a look at those because they're, they're quite an interesting new development in the world. <coughs> um, and finally, um, I'm insured up to the hilt. Um, professional and public liability are really important, particularly professional. Um, it just shows that you've got good ethics and that if something does go wrong, that you're fully protected, um, particularly as a sole trader versus um, a limited company. So I mentioned it a few times now, relationship with clients. Um, this top picture here, reality and dream. You're going to be the reality, the client's going to be the dream. They're going to want you to, to change their, their organisation, they're going to want you to make things better overnight, they're going to want you to help them hit their sales targets. Um, you've got to be really grounded when you're in PR. A lot of PR people will go in there and act like a lap dog and say, yes, yes, we can do that. Um, if you want to be an ethical practitioner, you've got to give them a dose of reality. Um, you have to have chemistry with the client to be able to do that. So again, there are going to be times where you can't you can't work with people, and that's where the difficult client head comes in. Um, you really have to sort of trust each other and get on well. And if you don't, you can't keep their feet on the ground. Um, the main thing for me is staying true to myself. I'm a consultant, so when they talk to me about something, I consult with them, and I'm open and honest and give them my ideas and opinions. Um, it works incredibly well with the majority of my clients. One or two, as I've said, I've walked away from. But the last thing I would ever be is a spin doctor, so I stick to my guns. And because of that, I do have a good reputation as being an ethical practitioner. Um, I only ever send out quality press releases as well. Often the clients will come to me and say, oh, it's a brilliant story. It's great for their organisation, but it's something that people in their own industry have been doing for years, and it's not a story for the media. <coughs> There's lots of times you kind of have to dampen it, and it's awful to see a client's face when you think that it's a massive story. And you kind of say, well, no, no so-and-so have already done it, and so-and-so have already done it, and it was in the newspaper three weeks ago for them. Um, you kind of knock the wind out of the sails, but then that's part of being ethical. <coughs> Relationship with journalists. This is an even harder relationship. Um, as a PR practitioner, you need them. But I know a lot of you are studying journalism as well, so please don't ever forget that you also need the PR people. Often they're a gateway to a really good story. Um, often they can also save your skin because they'll fill a space for you really quickly when you haven't got a story to put to the editor to go in. Um, so that relationship is really two-way. Um, over the last few years, the reduced staff on newspapers has led to quite a few people referring to reporters <coughs> as repeaters. So all they actually do is pick up press releases and put them in the newspaper to make their life easy. I 
think now with everything that's been going around, the Leveson Inquiry, um, all of the, the cases that have gone to court about where stories have come from, journalists have to be a lot more careful. So they'll be looking for you to be ethical so that they're ticking their own ethical box. Um, many are losing their jobs <coughs> coming into PR, which is really interesting to see them realise what it's like to be on this side. Um, a lot of them have actually gone back into journalism because it, they find the PR the harder side of it. Um, but the way to have a good relationship with a journalist, if you're a PR practitioner, and, and vice versa as well, um, is to be honest with each other, but professional. Um, the ones that I get the best results out of is, um, for my clients are those that I work as a team with. Um, I'm often aware of what they've got coming up um, if they're doing forward features, and I know that I can help them. Um, if I've helped them, then they're going to help me. At the end of the day, though, it has to be a good story. There's no whining and dining anymore. There's no, um, like our friend here, Piers, there's no taking uh, bribes or you can't buy journalists anymore. They're not even actually <coughs> allowed to receive freebies or gifts if you work on like products, if you're working with makeup or fashion. Um, for them to receive the gift, it has to now be put through a log as part of the magazine's um, entirety. They're not allowed to have that as like a personal gift. They can trial them and write um, sort of reports back on them. But if they actually take them home and they use them for personal purposes, um, they are taxed on it. So it's not something that they want to do. I mean, years ago, you used to be able to send them bottles of wine, uh, you used to be able to send them product samples, um, and it was more like a bribe, it was like friendship. Um, and you're saying, if I give you this, we put the client's story in. Just doesn't <coughs> work that way anymore. They have codes of conduct that they have to follow. So if you are going to be a good PR practitioner, you need to appreciate their codes of conduct as well. Relationships do become strained with journalists when you're dealing with a crisis. They've got their teeth into a really good story. You're trying to protect your client, to be honest and ethical. It, it does become strained, um, however good your relationship is. Um, there's one thing that really um, is, is a go-to for all crisis management. Whenever you issue a statement, do it in writing. If you give a verbal one, follow it up in writing. Particularly nowadays with the use of email, um, it's very easy to do that, or even if you're on the move to text it. And always use the phrase, use in full, because what they're very good at is taking part of a statement from your client that then spins a different message. So if you put use in full in the door, which you have the right to reply through the um, Press Complaints Commission, it all gets very nasty, and I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll pick up on that as part of your studies. But if you act ethical and you're working with ethical, ethical journalists, this is really a worst case scenario. <coughs> I mentioned um, everything being online now. Social media, um, something that we all do, we all love. We've seen so many reports of, of people who have come from it though. In PR and journalism, social, social media, you really have to be so careful. It's such a fine line between being ethical and actually breaking the law. Um, if you're using it as your own and you have a job and on there you say where you work, can you please make sure you put a disclaimer on that any of your opinions are your own and not a reflection on where you work? Because straight away, if you do put something on there that disagrees, particularly if you're working in public sector, NHS, um, classify it as a, a sackable offence. There's been quite a few people in the media recently who have lost their jobs for, for tweeting opinions on things. Um, so free speech is one thing, but you really need to be careful that um, you're not committing slander, libel, defamation of character, um, and now there's a new act called the Malicious Communications Act, which changes the way that everybody works and really should make you think twice on everything that you put out there, particularly on, uh, on Twitter and Facebook. I've got a couple of cases here for you to talk about. Um, one is a case of a chef. Um, I could use the case study, but I've signed an NDA, so I can't tell you which restaurant it was. Um, he was sacked for working at a restaurant and he knew that they um, had some bad practices, that their hygiene standards weren't as high as they should be, um, and he had access to the company Twitter account. So he took to it and um, unveiled all the restaurant's deepest, darkest secrets um, as, as a member of staff who had been sacked. Was he justified? Was that ethical? You can understand him doing it, probably not the way to voice it. He had all these secrets that he wanted people to know, but he did it on a personal personal level. Um, and he was actually charged by the police. 
Um, his case hasn't come to court yet, so I don't know what will happen to him. The one that's in the media at the moment that um, I hope you've all been following because it's of a, a local interest. Um, a 25-year-old man from Manchester called Martin Paul um, got access to a tribunal page, uh, sorry, a tribute page for a young girl, um, Caitlin Ruddy. If you're following that story, the 15-year-old that died in Colourcourt, she was washed off the, the pier. By the time they saved her, she went into a cardiac arrest and there was nothing they could do for her. Um, so her family and friends set up a tribute page. Um, it was absolutely inundated with messages and for some reason this 25 year old man, we still not got to the bottom of why, um, went on the tribute page, called her name, threatened to burn the flowers on site um, and just totally um, turned malicious. Um, he was charged, he was arrested immediately by the police, he's been charged um, and he's waiting his sentence under the Malicious Communications Act. It's likely that he's going to go to prison for it. So that's how serious um, the ethics on social media are getting now. There's really a fine line between breaking the law. So double think everything that you post. It's a crisis. Again, I've mentioned it a few times. You can't handle when a crisis be done ethically. So as a PR person, you're employed to protect your client and to look after their best interests. A lot of, a lot of the times, they're going to want you to protect them by hiding facts. Good PR, good crisis management shouldn't do that. Um, I don't cover up or try to make amends for anything that the client has done. My advice is always be open, be honest straight away, but act very quickly and have a plan that you can publicise straight away to say what you're going to do to put it right, um, what you're going to do to stop it happening again in the future. It's a bit like working backwards um, and really you have to fight with your clients to get them to do it, but if they ever want to retain their reputation and be able to repair it in the future, that's the only way that they can do it. Um, a good case study at the moment, a couple actually, um, Iceland there, uh, Drew Graham, who's a disabled athlete, this airline absolutely trashed his wheelchair, um, which cost £20,000, and for weeks and weeks they refused to accept um, responsibility for it. This shows you the power of social media. His dad took to social media and put a tweet on with a photograph of the mangled wheelchair. I'm sure you've all seen it in the papers. Um, it wasn't until it went viral and was getting thousands of retweets and hitting hundreds of countries across the world that Iceland Air actually responded. They, they, they have done the right thing now. They've replaced his chair and given him an even better wheelchair with all more cons and exactly what he needed. But they only did it under the weight of the social media campaign that was against them. <laughs> a really bad way to handle a crisis. That could have been nipped in the bud and no one would have ever known about it. But now we've got the whole world thinking twice. If I've got a crown, if I've got a wheelchair, if I've got any luggage, would I ever travel with Iceland there? I wouldn't. Um, another one at the moment is Hot Point. Is everyone aware of the Hot Point crisis that's going on? They've got a particular make of tumble dryer called Whirlpool. And um, a few weeks ago, one set on fire, and um, somebody's son died in the fire, um, a young boy. It's taken that for the media to get their hands on it and for it to come to light. This has been going on since 2004. This particular tumble dryer has caused 750 house fires, and insurance companies now will not cover your house if you've got a hot point tumble dryer. Um, they've, they've been taken to court um, by an, quite a number of insurance companies over it. Um, there was a huge section yesterday on, on this morning, um, TV programme about it. They had loads of families, all the heartstrings, the photos of all the families with the burnt out tumble dryers, you can imagine, um, kind of what the media have, have pulled into it. They had the man whose son had died, they had experts pulling the tumble dryers apart, showing why there was a fire and how easy it was to remedy it. 2004, this has been going on 12 years, we've got 5.3 million tumble dryers out there that are at risk of bursting into flames, and this company did nothing about it back in 2004 when they knew they were responsible for a house fire. Sadly, someone's had to die, um, and Hot Point are now really having to face the music. <coughs> the way to handle that crisis initially when they knew their tumble dryer was, was at fault, surely was to admit it straight away and to do a product recall. For it to have taken 12 years in a life is, is a terrible way to handle a crisis and they're clearly not an ethical company and I think their sales are going to suffer massively, their reputation is completely tarnished 
and it could have all been handled so differently. That's a great example of, of unethical PR and, and bad crisis management. So it's possibly also an example <coughs> of bad journalism PR. Where the hell were the press? Exactly. Well, maybe it's the, the quality of the PR which was keeping the press up with that. But I mean, that's <coughs> journalism should really track down. Yeah. That's ethically for the good of society. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, another thing for the good of society, we've talked about that, is um, <coughs> corporate social responsibility. As a PR practitioner, this is something that um, a lot of clients look to you for, for advice on how to do it. Um, it's actually now a, a responsibility under government governance. If you have a certain turnover and a certain number of staff, um, a percentage of your pocket has to go up to go back into the community in some way. So let me just, just make a point there. There is a question that you will all know, uh, if you're doing PR, there's a question on the ethics essays titles about uh, CSR. So, listen carefully at this point. Um, so at the moment, CSR, particularly in America, is um, really coming under um, a, lo a lot of scrutiny. Through kind of the last decade, it's been something that um, a lot of companies have done to either persuade opinion, um, get their way, or stage guilt. It's really been investigated in America um, in quite a number of cases, um, strongly. So if you Google it, um, there's a lot of cases come up now about it. But it is something that our government say that an organisation has to do. So they have to tread a fine line. And as a PR practitioner, you need to find an ethical way for them to tick that box. So it doesn't look like it can be bribery and that it is community investment. So the way to do that, and I'm doing a lot of this at the moment, it's taking up a lot of my time is to make sure that clients have a code of conduct on their website, a bit like we have the code of conduct for CIPR. Um, they need a code of conduct on their website so it's open and it's public and it declares why they donate a certain amount of money or why they get involved in a certain charity or a certain situation in the community. Um, there's two really good ones that I've got them on at the moment that are my <coughs> favourites. One's called Dill Pack, so have a look at that one. And the other one's called... Um, Columbus Global. It'll take you quite a while to read theirs. So it's very in depth, but it's really just <coughs> really um, And I think they're two companies that are really getting the CSR right. Um, one company that didn't, that I mentioned last time at the lecture, um, was Primark. I'm sure you'll remember a few years ago that there was um, a huge fire in a sweatshop. Um, and a lot of people died, and their error there was to throw money at the families. Um, and they got really bad press on the back of it. Not only had they done wrong, but then they felt by throwing money at the families that it was going to make up for loss of life. Um, they're now getting it right. Um, they've put a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of uh, manpower behind a project called Her Project. And so far, 4,500 women in Bangladesh have benefited from it. Um, if you have a look at businesscasestudies.co.uk forward slash Primark, um, there's a great example on there of, of the CSR that they're doing now and how they've turned around what was something incredibly unethical to something that now is, is really ticking the box. Um, the other thing is as well if you don't do CSR as well as not um, following your government governments, um, you're actually <coughs> likely to be picked out and highlighted in an annual award. Um, there are some people out there who have set up something called Public Eye Awards have a look on, on the website. You'd be amazed how many people, uh, sorry, how many of the companies that you recognise that should be doing CSR and aren't. Um, annually they put out their top 10 CSR records. Um, this year, the ones I'll pick out that you'll recognise are FIFA. Um, they're listed for post evictions and impacts on local communities <coughs> and social work from local from Brazil. They did absolutely nothing to make it better for the people whose backyard they were in. Gap is probably one that you've heard of in the media. Um, and again, this is about working in Bangladesh and not offering safety to, to workers out there. And HSBC, financing companies including Sight Derby and Wilmar associated with land grabs and human rights abuses. So they've just been handed money to <coughs> the private centre without making sure that it's being used ethically. And then they've not encouraged CSR, they've not done any CSR of their own. Um, whether that's right or not, I'll let you have a read of them and you can decide yourself. Because sometimes, whether it's ethical or not, comes down to personal opinion on those kind of cases. Finally, um, 
as a practitioner, you need to look at your own self-promotion. <coughs> you do have to practice what you preach, but it's difficult for you to be in the media and to have more spotlight than your clients do. There's a number of um, agencies in the North East that have a bad taste in the mouth of other practitioners because they spend a lot of time on their own PR and we all wonder who they work for because we don't know if they've got the time to have any clients. Um, it's a really fine line. You do have to practice what you preach. You can't tell your client that they need to be in the newspaper, <coughs> they need to be online, they need to have social media, uh, they need to be in magazines if you're not doing it yourself for your own business. Um, I always make sure I have my own coverage, but I make sure my clients get much more. And if I'm going to be in a magazine, I've always made an arrangement with uh, the editors that my clients are in as well. I never appear standalone in a magazine. I always do it as a double story. This is my story, if you like that, if you like this one even more, that's from my client. Um, works well. I've got a magazine here called More Than Insight. Hopefully you'll all be aware of it. It's a really good business magazine that circulates the North East. Um, on the back of the lectures that I've been doing on, on ethical PR, I've actually written an article for it. So again, I'm gonna leave that and it'll be photocopied and passed around. Um, in a nutshell, everything I've just talked about is in here. So that would be a good refer to tool for you. Um, I've also got some business cards down here. Uh, last year I did help quite a few of the students with their final papers. Um, if they were sort of coming and ahhing which side to go on the ethical line on any of what we've talked about today. So if any of you do have any questions or just want a little bit of support, please take a card and feel free to email me. Uh, you can also find me on social media, um, Twitter at Antonia Brindle. <coughs> and um, I'm on Get Brindled on Facebook. Um, so again, feel free to use those forms of communication to get in touch with me if you need any information. So finally, the summary. Um, I think what, what my main point is, everything you do in your work, question it. Whether you're a journalist or you're a PR practitioner, dig deep within yourself before you do anything, before you put anything to print, before you put anything out online, and think, what I'm about to do, will this make me proud when other people see it, or will I not want people to know that I've done this and been involved? If it's the latter, don't do it. Get your clients to do the same when you're doing that. So, history of PR is shaky. Hopefully now you'll see the way that practitioners have to operate, um, especially journalists as well. Because of the law and because of codes of conduct, um, it can, PR can be ethical, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And so, um, <coughs> just to put it out there, um, you can get in touch with her if you want to use her as a source. Uh, the, the, this talk has been video on our fingers crossed, uh, and we will put it on uh, our. University YouTube site. Um, fingers crossed that it has worked. And Antonio's kindly allowed us to do that. I'm uh, hoping to do that with all of the, uh, the talks in this series, not mine, but the ones that our guests come to do. So we'll put them up there, and you can quote from them uh, in, in assignments. Um, in, in the second set of assignments that we'll do, uh, the project, which um, details of which you'll get in, in March next month, um, there will be, uh, without giving the details now, I'll tell you there will definitely be s at least one s question which will ask you to interrogate that relationship between journalism and PR. At that stage, I mean, it's a popular one in past people, have, if you, lots of journalism and PR students have done that <coughs> question. And they, one problem certainly journalism students run up against is trying to find somebody from PR to contact as a source. So um, I'm saying this with slight hesitance in my voice because I don't want all, all 147 of you getting in touch with this sole practitioner. Um, it would be really handy if you could spread it out a bit and contact various people. But um, Antonia has very kindly run it boldly offered her, her assistance with this, with this piece of work. So, uh, before we um, wrap up, can I just ask you to um, ask a question or two? Has anybody got any questions? Oh, can I you? Do you have any, any questions? Ask, ask them now, please. <coughs> I don't 
what's really fascinating, some, I mean, really fascinating, um, lots of those things. I mean, I heard you, you give the talk last year, and it made things even better this year. It's, really, it's been really good both years. So, I mean, I learned a few things there, and you might find that very hard to learn, to learn, but clearly, I know everything it's about, but the, those tiny corners, and, I didn't know, was little bits that I needed just to fill up my enormous stock of knowledge. That's what I'm this for. So, questions, please. You find that um, you react in a certain way, if it may shut the door for some of the special points, you find that other potential clients make more of the Absolutely. And they may find each other. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Funnily enough, one client who um, I chose not to work with um, because, firstly, what, what they wanted me to achieve wasn't really within my expertise, and I was honest about that rather than just taking money. Um, and secondly, I didn't feel that what they wanted to achieve was particularly ethical. Um, and I, I explained, and we shook hands and said we won't work together, and I recommended somebody else who I thought would work with them. And they went on to recommend me to a charity that he sits on the board of. And they were they got in contact with me, and they've been a client now for a year. So on the back of me being honest and open and ethical, I got a really good client who I wake up <coughs> in the morning and actually want to work for because I'm making a difference and doing good for them. I'm not putting a fat cat in a bigger car. I'm actually making a difference to a charity. So it's a win-win situation. That, that's, that's a great example of a win-win situation. Um, I think I've mentioned to you before, and I certainly will mention again, that, that in journalism and in PR, the, the win-win situation is that you can be ethical, you can do good for society, and make money. Um, it happens in journalism um, a lot. I mean, if you think about the big investigative re reports that we've had in journalism, say the the Telegraph's investigation of spot, bet, spot uh, betting uh, in cricket or the Telegraph's investigation of MPs' expenses, um, that put on circulation for that newspaper. <coughs> when the Guardian was investigating Hatgate or it was investigating uh, state surveillance, it put on, uh, it sold copies. Um, not enough probably to save me old war horse, but it's, it's, it's still there. The Independence Club, but the Guardian to the left now. Um, and of course, th there is an example also that, that we've tried, I've tried to come back to several times this module already, is that ethics, uh, ethical PR can actually make a difference to society. It's not just about <coughs> the art people making a difference for fat cats in, in fast cars. Mm. Any more, that was a really good question, sir. Any, any more questions? Sir? Do you find yourself, you and other practitioners, Bunching together because you're more ethical than the rest, or do you find yourself, you know, wondering if you're the only ethical one out there? <laughs> no, there are quite a few of my peers who are ethical as well. Um, I'm going to be totally honest. I tend to find that it's the small traders or the smaller PR companies. Um, the bigger a PR company becomes, the, the less the ethics mean to, to mean to them. Um, so. In that way, yeah, I guess we are bunched together because I can name any of the other people in the region that I think are ethical. Um, what I wouldn't do is tell you I think they didn't. <laughs> I would be ethical. I, I might, as I know, I know who they are. <laughs> any other questions? But that's actually so, right, that is still a really interesting question so, because actually, you're right, you do bunch together. And um, one, of, one of the other practitioners who was very ethical came across a potential client in the industry in the field that she had no experience in that I did, but she gave me that client. Yeah. So it works really well. <coughs> it tends to be good, children. I remember to wear sunscreen all the time. <laughs> ben? Do you ever feel limited by your Not really, but I think that's probably because of the amount of years I've been practicing PR and that I've chosen to go down this route now. Um, I've, I've had over 20 years of experience, I've worked in big agencies, I've had the, the days of the champagne drinking with clients and things like that, and the freedom to, to do a lot of things. But I think now, actually, <coughs> I've got more freedom because I can be honest and open because I'm not answering to anybody but myself and my own ethics. So that in itself gives you more freedom. While I'm probably limited with who I can work with, I've got more freedom in my choice of who I work with. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, so I suppose a corollary of that is the fact that, you know, did you, when you, can you tell us, when you were working for an agency, did you do anything which you would now regard as an ethical? When I was working for a particular agency, I worked for a client who worked on something um, pretty horrendous, through a care agency. And somebody had died in their care, an old lady, and the family were pursuing it and going to the media blaming the care home. Um, and the care, care home ended up having to get in um, investigation parties, um, which I had to be part of, and their reports to be able to put up on a fair statement out. And they were not coming down on the side of the care home. And the company that I worked for made me write a statement and send it to the media. And I've never forgotten it to this day. And I was approached and asked to go to court and stand by the company. And I refused to do it as the company were trying to do the newspaper who ran the story anyway. I was put in such a predicament that if I had gone to court to support that client, um, the journalists would never have touched my stories again and my career was over. So I, I knew I was either faced with losing my job from that agency for not looking after a client all losing my whole career. Um, I did go and sit and talk to um, a number of um, legal representative parties um, and was advised not to go to court and luckily I wasn't subpoenaed, I wasn't called um, and it all just did die in more way but it could have been really detrimental. Really detrimental. And it was a horrible situation, I didn't sleep for about a year and I honestly thought what am I doing in PR? You're going to have those times. I mean, ethics does, again, as we said several so times, kind of get down to individual ethics, <coughs> individual conscience. When, when it comes to the room, when it comes to the, the crisis moment, um, generally it's you. It's you lying awake at night. If you're a journalist or a, a, a PR practitioner, it gets down ultimately to you. The book stops with you. I mean, you, if you work for a newspaper or a magazine or an agency, you can, you do have the, uh, the right to say no. Um, you, you might well lose your job, but it's about saving, saving your, um, your conscience. And in that scenario, when, when you send a press release out to the media or a statement or anything, I always put my contact details on the bottom and I always put myself as a media contact. And um, the only reason that I agreed that that statement could go out um, from, from my computer was if it wasn't with my name on it, and it went for an import act the name of the agency on because I said I'm not I'm not taking personal liability for it because I don't stand by it and I don't believe it to be one the truth. And I really thought I was gonna lose my job over being honest. I didn't. <laughs> the NUJ has tried since Leveston to um, and before Leveston to have um, uh, a conscience clause written into a uh, journalism <laughs> journalist contract so that if it comes to the to the room, if they get to the point where they feel they cannot do what an editor asks them to do for ethical re reasons, then they, then they have the right to do that with impunity. It hasn't quite happened yet. Um, I used to, when I started doing this module several years ago, that used to be the, the question I used to find the hardest to answer, was when journalists and students said to me, well, okay, then what happens when I get that kind of situation, when I'm asked by an editor to do something, and um, I don't want to do it, and I, I used to find it so hard to answer it. And I can only say what I've done in the past was that uh, once I've become slightly more established and was older and, and tougher, I felt I could stand up to it, to that kind of question. I, I found it much harder when I was a very young journalist. It's very hard to say, to say no. And then the Leveson inquiry came out. I remember for maybe two years, my slides up here saying, at last, I can answer this question. When the Leveson inquiry finishes, I'll better tell you precisely there will be a conscience clause and you can, you can can with impunity not do something like that. Unfortunately, it's still not there. I mean, the, 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 the ethos is changing, but unless it's, unless it's been typed in last night, I haven't seen the, the conscience clause yet. Any other questions? Any other questions? No, well, um, I hope, um, uh, I know you'll, you'll agree with me that this was uh, a very interesting and useful talk. If you could show your presentation once again.